Have you got any night out stories that actually happened from your career? Or anything that you can reveal without incriminating anyone? I can't remember whether it's public that I'm <laughs> or not. Is that one? <laughs> we, can, we can bleep it. Welcome back to Pints with the Pros. On today's episode, founder, CEO, podcaster, and probably the fastest man on YouTube. Charlie, we've actually got a uh, pretty big guest today. I think we should probably do something about the set. It looks so disappointing. <laughs> That's right, we got Andy Badley on the show. The greatest. Probably the fastest man that will ever appear on this show. We're doing well if we get anybody faster, that's for sure. <laughs> Depends on what distance, right? Yeah, Maybe, that's true. It's a distance project though, so if you're going to start going lower and lower, yeah, like you're not going to get any yeah, 400 but meter guys. Three, 349 mile? Yeah. That's not bad. Ago. That's not bad at all. That's not bad. So, athletics in 2023 for you is yeah. very different to how you used to view athletics when you yeah. were competing and training as an athlete. How do you think things have changed from an outside perspective? So now you've stepped away from the professional scene, even though this is pints with the pros, you're still counting our yeah, eyes. Yeah, thanks. How do you view athletics now? Do you think things have progressed in a sort of positive way? Are athletes, is it a friendlier, more inclusive space compared to the, the harsh rivalries you used to have? Or was it, was it all fun and games back in the day as well? I had some good friends when I was competing. So Tom Lancashire was probably my biggest rival as I was running, uh -huh. uh, from GB at least. And, and like, we're pretty close, stay in touch now. Yeah. Um, but I think the biggest difference, from, from an outsider's viewpoint anyway, like I definitely felt like I was competing. Maybe it was the tail end of it, but EPO was still rife, or like drugs in general was, was still rife. Mm -hmm. um, and it could have been worse, I suppose, if you think about that early 2000s. Like that's when I was just coming up and then I made my first Olympics in 2008. I think the early 2000s was maybe worse. They were still yeah. developing the tests and all that sort of stuff. But like, you know, I look back at the lists of people that I raced against. Um, and there's, a, there's so many doubts hanging over so many different people. You know, mm -hmm. the, the person that won my Olympic final in 2008 did fairly immediately test positive and then was subsequently banned and I got bumped up. Yeah. And um, what, what was the atmosphere like at the time? So nowadays you obviously hear, oh, we think X, Y, and Z is doing this, or this person, there's kind of, you know, there was a whole um, kind of controversy about someone when they've just, you know, risen out of nowhere and people just sort of label them. Back in the day, was it the same rumours and conversations? Yeah. Or was it kind of just considered that oh, some people do it, some people you know, don't? Yeah, you definitely knew a whole bunch of people were, were cheating, um, or, or had it had your, you know, you assumed mm -hmm. because you you have a. I felt like I had decent knowledge. I was more than willing to accept people were better than me at mm -hmm. that stuff, or could train harder and withstand higher volumes of training. But there was also like you've got a reasonable knowledge of what's possible, mm -hmm. and especially when you then see people might talk about their training or whatever. You think, oh, I just don't. I don't know how you can do it. Yeah. Uh, and, and yet, some of that's, you know, there would just be people who were better runners, mm -hmm. uh, but some of them also then were born out to be cheats in terms of testing positive and stuff like that. So you just try not to think about it. It did, I think, almost ruin my career in 2011. I tried everything that year, having just not quite been able to, to get the medals that I, that I wanted. Some of that was just my fault. I just ran badly or made yeah. bad decisions. But then you, I started pursuing it and I trained too hard and I tried too many things like altitude, altitude tents, different supplements, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just wiped out that whole year of my career. And then I just about managed to get it back in 2012, basically. So you mentioned that back in the day you were trying a lot of things as you kind of got towards the end of your career, would you say, in terms of, I've done all the training, I've got what I think I can get out of myself, what can I try, supplements, altitude tents. Do you, did you find that you struggled with a social aspect at that time in terms of were you being really careful what you ate, were you not drinking alcohol, would you say that kind of any negative elements were affected because of your pursuit of trying to be the best you could be? Throughout my career, one of the things I would change going back is I was too serious maybe. Like I guess I felt like I had to, that was my only route to success was like just be so dedicated, so professional. Like I never wanted to be called into question either by myself at the end of each day mm -hmm. or by someone else I could have done something else mm -hmm. but that I put so much pressure on myself I got really nervous and I probably built everything up to be 
it, it became probably detrimental the level of nerves that I would get. Mm -hmm. But related to sacrifices and so on, yeah, I, I didn't drink alcohol at all during the season. Um, I to, to to like stay in an altitude tent or go to altitude you're often on these training camps for weeks or months at mm -hmm. the time and staying in an altitude tent is not very sociable because you've yeah. got to be in it for a certain number of hours for it to have the right level of impact mm -hmm. um, so yeah definitely felt like I gave up a lot of stuff um, because ironically I, I wasn't really cut out for like <laughs> distance running I'm, I'm a sociable person I enjoyed much more training with my training group than I did like being on my own on a long run or anything like yeah. that. The th biggest learning for me was that like I, I ran my best when I was happiest. Mm -hmm. um, sounds really trite and simple, but a happy athlete ends up running faster. Like that, that, that actually was in my physically best shape for the, just before the London 2012 Olympics. Mm -hmm. um, and then I carried a little niggle into the, the games themselves. <laughs> but at that point, I was in my best ever shape. And that year came after the worst ever year in 2011 when I did all of this stuff wrong. And we all just, we just went back to basics, me and my coach. We, I didn't go to altitude. I didn't really go away training very much or certainly not messing about with altitude or like, I literally just ate sensible food, mm -hmm. um, hung around with people that gave me energy rather yeah, than yeah, like yeah. sucking energy out of the room, you know, no, no negative influences. I didn't try and hammer myself in any sessions. I just tried to put together a year of like pretty consistent stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was, the, the answer is boring, but like surround yourself with people that if there's someone in your life, coach, agent, training partner, that like you have that kind of I don't know edge of anxiety, then they shouldn't they shouldn't be involved. Cut them out, move on somewhere else, whatever. But at the same time, when you've found something that that works for you, you're happy and contented, then don't pursue through social media or Strava or whatever else. Like, oh my God, that group's doing this. Why am I doing that training session? You're not doing that training session because you haven't done the rest of their training for the last six months, so it's completely irrelevant to you. Mm -hmm. So it's being comfortable enough in, like I was fortunate through most of my career that I couldn't compare, unless someone called me up and told me what training they were doing, I couldn't find it out. Or I read it in a magazine or something, like proper old school or an online blog. There wasn't, there weren't YouTube videos of everyone's workouts. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just had to stick to what I believed in. I believed in the relationship I had with my coach. Um, he was my best man at my wedding, he's the godfather to one of my children, like we are, we are that close. And there were periods in my career where I kind of took that for granted a little bit and started taking bits and pieces from what other people said to me and trying to feed that in where it just didn't fit in like my own routine and how my body worked, which he understood, but I didn't. Tell us, tell us what you're thinking. Okay, it's a picture of the 2012 Olympic trials and uh, the chap, who I know exactly who this is, in the gate to vest that you can learn out is Ross Murray. Oh, good knowledge, okay. So yeah, Ross and I were on the team together uh, for 1500 metres in 2012. Nice, years. okay. And his face looks great. This is the, the reveal of that one. <laughs> I'm sure he'll appreciate you need to show that in, yeah. the, in the reveal in the video. Yeah. Next one. I think this one might be a little bit harder, but maybe not for you, a man of knowledge. Oh, I know it's the Dream Mile in Oslo 2008. Uh... Did you win that one? Do you want to plug if you won that? I did, I did win that, yeah, yeah. 349. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I, I want to say Augustin Chogi, but it's not because George Chogi was an Adidas athlete, not a Nike athlete. Oh, I remember who it is, but I can't remember his name. That's embarrassing, isn't it? Okay, if when, when you win, you don't have to remember everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if your surname begins with a K. <laughs> that doesn't help. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and Kenyan, so Kip something, no. Oh, Kitani, yes. Okay, yeah, my bad. Is he any good? No, I beat him, so he can't <laughs> yeah. have been any good. <laughs> so, like, talk us through like how you felt in the moment and what oh, it is. Oh, thanks for this one. Fucking hell. Do we swear? Do you yeah, swear yeah, in these yeah, videos? Yeah, uh, well, I know exactly when this was. Literally the, <laughs> the lowest moment of my entire athletics career. So this is... <laughs> this is Barcelona European Champs uh, 2010. Uh, it's me, Colin McCourt, and Tom Lancashire. Um, so I've got the blue number on because I had the fastest time in Europe going into this race. And uh, I was dead set on winning like I absolutely convinced I could win gold and I came sixth in the end and I was second coming into the home straight and there four of the guys five of the guys four, one, two, three, four of the guys just ate me up with like 30 minutes to go still have nightmares about it so thanks for that three of you in the final yeah which was amazing and actually made the front page of the Spanish press because they had three Spanish in the final as well um, and it was in Barcelona, so it was like the Brits against Spain and they absolutely hammered us. That's like, they got like one, three, four, I think. Loads of people think that the country compatriots talk about tactics. And the irony was if Tom and I, in this instance, had actually talked about tactics, we both probably could have got a medal. 
but we were rivals and we didn't want to help each other out and that's another thing I might change okay. um, and we, we both had a very similar plan which was regardless of the pace make sure we're at the front with 500 to go and go hard Tom I'm sure would say when he got to the front with 500 to go in this final he went way too hard like way 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 too hard and I went with him and I think I ran a 50 point from 500 till, till 100 to go and that's why I couldn't hold it together for that last for that last 100 meters uh, because I knew that if I was going to go I was just going to go and I had this running style where you couldn't tell if I was going you know, 52 second pace or 62 second pace so I was going to use that to my advantage and just wind up every 100 meters like El Gruz used to do. Um, and if we talked about it, that strategy would have helped us both out. Um, but he just tried to absolutely obliterate the field and like he killed us both doing it. And so neither of us ended up in the middle. Um, but yeah, you can't criticize him for it. We, we just, it was that split second. If I'd, if I'd just gone half a second earlier, then I'd have been the lead. He would have waited. Things would have been totally different. But that one gives me nightmares for sure. If you're new around here, Days Brewing is a 0% alcohol beer. The lager cans are now available in Waitrose, but I'd recommend you buy online using code CALLUM20. You get 20% off, you help support me and Charlie behind the camera, and also you get some delicious beers that don't have any negative effects. What more could you want? I've one banged it, I'm back! So, you've had an amazing, successful career, and now you're looking at your sort of situation, you're thinking, have I got another year in me at running? Could I do another season? Where's my body at? All these situations. What has gone from that point there to now having a really successful, not just YouTube channel as such, but complete sort of media agency business in the running channel? It didn't happen straight away. And, I, and I'd at least been thinking about it as I was coming towards retirement. So I tried to come back for 2016 Olympics um, and I didn't make it. Um, I'd had really serious knee surgery the year before that Olympic cycle. Um, and during that period, I spent a lot of time with a um, physio and a friend of mine, Mark Buckingham, and we kind of decided that we were going to try and run Olympic level training camps for normal athletes. Um, and we went through all of that process, and as part of that process, I met um, the guy who owns a, a media agency in London. Um, and then when things kind of like, got to the point of retiring and so on, we together ended up setting up the, the running channel. Mm -hmm. So he had the media and content background and I had the running knowledge and the, this passion to kind of, I wasn't that in love with, with the pro side of running anymore. Like the pressure that I felt to perform and like ultimately you didn't run well on a specific day, you didn't get funding, you didn't get a contract for the next year, you couldn't afford to live. Mm -hmm. Like, and just how nervous I got for racing. Um, but all the, all the way through my career, I got asked lots of questions about what should I do in this situation? or how can I motivate myself when I feel like this about running and I felt like I was in a position to help with that stuff. Um, so then that, that's what the running channel is. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not aimed at pro runners. Mm -hmm. And actually, initially I wasn't really on the channel because I didn't think I was that relevant to the people I was trying to speak to. It's just anyone who loves running and wants to get a little bit more out of running, like whether they're running their first 10K or trying to chase their sixth world marathon major, sixth star. Um, but then increasingly I did a little bit more because I wanted to try to help and so if I could add kind of that elite experience or um, the knowledge of the different mistakes that I've made in my career and help people not make those mistakes then that's when I started doing more and then that's what you know four years on or whatever the running channel has become. But what's interesting with you is unlike the other people we've had on the, the episodes you've had this whole pro career of <laughs> 10 plus years of running at top level yeah. been to major championships you know your phone book must be full of all different athletes <laughs> I'm interested to know if there's been any sort of actual night out? Have you lived this dream night out before? I think you're painting me in a much cooler light <laughs> than, than I really am. Um, I was so boring. Um, but like, yeah, I did enjoy the odd night out. Um, I definitely remember one big one after 2012 um, with Mo. Like, you know, we, we, we'd lived together quite at the start of my career back in 2004 at St Mary's University. Um, so I knew him, you know, well, and we've been on teams throughout, throughout our career. Um, and it was, I can't remember exactly who else was there, they'll get cross with me if I see this. Um, <laughs> but weirdly, we just, we just, it was really quiet, it wasn't like we were going to go out for a big night. We went out to somewhere in Richmond in South West London, but this was like literally a, a month or, or even just a few weeks after Super Saturday. Okay. Um, so he was probably the most famous person in the UK at that point. And then, yeah, we, we just sat there um, in this bar and it was pretty much empty. So it, was, it, was either, it wasn't like a high profile bar. And then just people clearly like it's the first time I've ever witnessed you know like if there's a proper Hollywood celebrity and people yeah. start sharing a photo and then oh come and come and see this person's in this bar yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah like that's what happened so it went from like 
it, it wasn't that it got busier just because the night was getting busier. It was that like people came to see Mark. Yeah. So you just it went from being us, probably like four or five of us out of ten with a whole bar, mm-hmm. and then to being like 100, 200 people crammed into the oh, space wow. just being like, look over there, who's that guy? Trying to get photos and stuff like yeah. that. And he had come out for like the opposite of that. He wanted like a low-key yeah. night, and obviously he couldn't get it. Like That was my brush with someone that famous at that point in their career. And then weirdly, we went out to... Um, <laughs> I had never been to Oceana. Okay. Oceana, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ever. That doesn't exist anymore, I don't no, think. No, yeah. probably not. Yeah. Um, and there was, one, there was one in Kingston. And for some reason, we decided that's where we'd go. Yeah. And like, because we would know, we could like get straight in. I love that. And it was awful. I don't no think we stayed, we didn't stay for very long, so. Um, but yeah, he got like a shout out from the, the MC or the DJ or whatever. And yeah, that was, that was a surreal, it was a surreal night, but it wasn't particularly crazy. Was, awesome, uh, pretty, no, that's a pretty, great story. Pretty civilized. Yeah. I reckon they were underrated because World Athletics made a massive mistake in not regulating them more quickly and then ended up essentially conforming their regulations to exactly what Nike already had and then all of the other manufacturers had to play catch up. And then now, now maybe they're overrated because all of the technology is trickling down from these super shoes into like the regular trainers as well so you could possibly go almost as fast in some of the like slightly cheaper shoes. Good for good if you care about records because the problem I had was um, athletes were supposed to run, you know, 56, 56, 56, and they'd go 51 the first lap. And that's like ruins the whole race if you follow it and if you don't have a good enough judge. So if you want to run your fastest possible time and get the most out of like human performance, then uh, the wave good in terms of learning how to race. And, that. and what about as a spectator, good or bad? Well, it's good because you can see, like, it's very hard. There are certain places, even at the World Champs, I found it difficult to see the clocks and work out exactly what split times people are running. So as an engaged fan wanting to know whether someone's on for world record, um, then I think it's good because you can see whether they're going to break a world record or not instead of just it flashing up on the screen at the end. Um, I, I wish I'd been able to do it. Because okay. it seems to have made a massive difference to how fast people can run and be able to. I just couldn't have recovered because I didn't have the shoe technology to help me recover and run that much volume in one day at that intensity. So I guess it's underrated because people might not know about it and people are just start, starting to cut on to the fact that Inga Britson is like a pretty much a staple of what he does. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I always had the rule that, like, I used to joke, like, if, you go, if you're going to wear sunglasses, you've got to win. Yeah. So, you know, Josh did a pretty good job at the World Champs. Um, and I, I loved hearing Jake's take on it in the studio from the BBC when they were asking, is he going to take his sunglasses off? And, and Jake's like, no, he's getting paid. <laughs> like, it, 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 certainly in the distance races, it's quite hard to get paid. Like, you, you get a lane in a Diamond League race in the 400, and you get paid down to eighth place. In the Diamond League, there might be 12 or 15 guys in the 1500 and only pay down to eighth. So it can be super fast. You can, there's been races where people are running 330 and coming ninth. So, and then you don't get paid at all. So I, it's a long-winded way of me, way of me saying, I actually am I'm all for athletes being able to make the best living they can for those like two or three years when they can be at their very peak. Love it, love it. No, I wouldn't have been. I, uh, like now I, I probably, I, I post all, most of my stuff on Strava now because I quite like getting that kind of validation. But no, then I would have been really secretive about it. For some reason I would have been worried about other people knowing these secrets that like no one else could possibly have invented 8 by a K. Yeah. Like do you wish that more pro athletes now posted their workouts on Strava or do you quite like the not knowing how people are shaping up? I think, it, I think if someone's going to do it, then for it to be meaningful, you kind of need to see everything. Mm-hmm. So uh, definitely I think a lot of pros are picking and choosing and they only post their amazing workouts to try and scare their mm-hmm. competitors maybe. But if you're wise to that and they're like, well, have they tapered for two weeks just to do that workout, just to post it on Strava, it's sort of irrelevant. Yeah. Or, if you, or if you see that someone's doing it as part of a 100 mile week, then all of a sudden you're like, okay, I, I get where this fits in. So it's context is everything. What I'm super interested to know is how it looks from the perspective of finishing up as a professional athlete. Because I'm very much at the opposite end of you. I'm kind of trying to become a professional yeah. athlete, right? And trying to be on the upward trajectory and have to really focus on all these little 1% gains in order to try and add up and get to where I am. And I can't imagine waking up tomorrow and being like, oh, I've got no training to do, or not training for an event, or coaches not put anything on my training peaks. Like, what does kind of life look like now? Did, did it come with all these extra things that you were now allowed to do, or was it very much the opposite, and you were kind of like, oh, crap, like, I haven't got anything to do? It's a hard decision to make that you're just going to stop. And it, it was, it, but I did make the decision, like, right, I'm done now, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and it was because I'd not made the Olympics in 2016, 
I was though going to carry on, but then I just kept picking up these little niggles and just couldn't shake them off. And then my son, my second child, was born, and the selfishness that I've described, like how much I was giving up, I was like, I don't really want to do this anymore. Um, and yeah, that, that moment that decision was made, it was like this massive weight was lifted mm -hmm. because I didn't have to, I was running because I had to, mm -hmm. not because I enjoyed it anymore. Um, so I, when I stopped, it was the best feeling ever. And yeah, I did like just eat takeaways for like a few weeks <laughs> and, and drink a lot more than I've been drinking. And, uh, and then, and then that, that actually gets boring pretty quick, but that's the thing I've been craving for ages. Yeah. And then I went and I was like, I'm going to play tennis, I'm going to play a bit of football because all the things I wouldn't have risked doing before. Um, I got all of that out of my system, and then, but it did take about a year for me to get back to even really want to go running again. Yeah. What's Andy Badley's go-to takeaway if you if you're feeling oh, feeling a bit frisky on a Saturday and I'm you want to? So boring, but I like the proper like chip shop chips and yeah. like the awful sausages that they that they serve. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I'm, because In I batter or without? Either whatever okay. whatever whatever they've got. Yeah. So um, that will, that will be my go-to. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Andy, thanks so much for coming on. Much appreciated. What is next for you in the world of running, content, business, life? Terrifyingly, all of those things are combined into me running my first ever marathon in Valencia in December. Oh dear, so the 3.49 man that we got on as a miler is taking on a marathon. Everyone's doing that these yeah, days. Yeah, maybe I'll run 3.49 for the marathon. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Much appreciated. And uh, thanks for tuning in to Pints with the Pros with the pro slash ex-pro, maybe pro marathoner, technically. Just an old guy. Yeah, just someone slightly older. <laughs> but the best story so far, I'm sure you'll agree. So thanks for tuning in and we'll see you in the next episode.